Hello everyone, my name is Benjamin Lebwal. I'm a gastroenterologist and director of clinical research at the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University. Um, and today I'm delighted to talk to you about the diagnosis and management of celiac disease. Now, when thinking about making the diagnosis, really the first question is, when should we be thinking about celiac disease? In what kind of uh, person should we be thinking about doing a test? And so that's really changed over time because uh, the, the popular image of celiac disease has changed over time. Shown here is an old textbook. Uh, and this was what we thought celiac disease looked like. We thought it was predominantly a condition of childhood um, in which young children um, were having difficulty absorbing nutrients. And so as a result, they would have abdominal distension or swollen abdomens and diarrhea. Um, they wouldn't be eating, they'd be losing weight and be wasting away. Thankfully, this is not uh, the picture of celiac disease today. Um, we still make the diagnosis in young children, and we still see people who have diarrhea as their predominant symptom, but there's so many other ways that people present with celiac disease. We call that non-classical celiac disease because it's not like the way the old textbooks describe them. So they would have um, for example, uh, someone would feel fine, but they'd have low levels of iron or folate or folic acid in their blood on um, screening. Or maybe they had irregular bowel problems like constipation or told of irritable bowel syndrome. They might have uh, issues with their dental enamel. They might have neurological symptoms. Maybe they feel fine, but going to the pediatrician, they're found to uh, be falling off the growth curve in terms of their expected height. Or maybe they have elevated, elevated liver enzymes, or maybe they were having issues with fertility or osteoporosis, brittle bones, uh, delayed puberty, fatigue. The list goes on and on. It's shown here are just some of the more common forms of celiac disease. So uh, when making a diagnosis, you really have to be keyed into the many, many different ways that this can behave. It very much is like a chameleon. It can uh, have many different symptoms and signs or sometimes none at all. In fact, there's something called silent celiac disease where a person has celiac disease, but they feel perfectly fine. We pick it up, we make the diagnosis because we screened them, whether because they have uh, a family uh, relative who has celiac disease. So if someone's mother has celiac disease, they might get tested for it. Or maybe they have a condition, a medical condition that is associated with an increased rate or risk of celiac disease, such as type one diabetes. Now we call that silent celiac disease, though sometimes people get diagnosed and then they tell us, well, in retrospect, it wasn't silent. I thought it was silent, but in retrospect, um, I was having to take a nap every afternoon. I was exhausted or I had a lot of gastrointestinal problems. I was running to the toilet many times and I didn't realize that that was not normal. And only after the diagnosis um, did uh, and, and treatment with a gluten-free diet did I realize that that was a symptom. Still, there are people who truly have no symptoms whatsoever. It's one of the more interesting things about this condition is it can cause such a, a wide array of symptoms and sometimes none at all. Shown here um, uh, is the relative distribution in adults in the modern era. That is to say, uh, these days when we have blood tests that can uh, test for celiac disease. And the, the most notable finding of this pie chart is that the diarrhea only encompasses 43% of people who got diagnosed with celiac disease. There's this old notion that's actually shown to be a myth that everyone with celiacs got diarrhea. And in fact, the majority don't. And if you look at what are the other causes, things like abdominal pain and weight loss, but sometimes osteoporosis, bone disease, or anemia, sometimes it's found incidentally. So someone has an upper endoscopy, a procedure looking at the esophagus because of reflux, and they're found to have an abnormal appearing small intestine, they get diagnosed. Or sometimes someone feels fine, but they get screened because of their family history. So it really is a wide variety of reasons someone might get tested and diagnosed. So how do you make the diagnosis? It typically starts with a blood test. And the blood test that has the highest accuracy is the tissue transglutaminase IgA. It's also known as the TTG. It has a sensitivity of 90%. That means that nine out of 10 people with celiac disease will have an abnormal TTG IgA result. It has a specificity of 98%, which means that 98% of people without celiac disease will have a normal or negative result. 
but it's not perfect. These numbers are not 100%. And particularly, um, this is affected by certain people who have low levels or undetectable levels of a kind of antibody class called IgA. Uh, there are people who have IgA deficiency. And in them, it's harder to figure out if they have celiac disease. For that reason, there's another class of antibodies called IgG that have celiac related values. And those could be tested, but they tend to be less accurate than the IgA tests. So it, it is a trickier diagnosis and, and really needs to be done with, with the utmost of, of um, care. There's the deamidated glidin peptide IgG and the tissue transglutaminase IgG. But really those blood tests are not as accurate as that first one, the tissue transglutaminase IgA. If that is elevated, then uh, a person will typically undergo an upper gastrointestinal endoscopy in which the small intestine is visualized. Shown on the left is a normal appearing small intestine. Um, and each of these ridges um, is a fold that it really is there to maximize surface areas so that nutrients can be absorbed. Um, on the right is shown similar folds, but here you could see that it looks like almost chat lips. These are called scalloped folds, like sea scallops. And it's one of the signs of damage we sometimes see in someone with celiac disease. But what's key is that actually both of these pictures are of people with celiac disease. How it looks to the eye when you're doing an endoscopy is not a great predictor of whether celiac is present. It's all about what it looks like under the microscope. And I'll show you some images there in a moment. A couple more endoscopy images. These are also of that small intestine right after the stomach. It's called the duodenum. Here, there's a relative loss of folds. Um, we don't see as many ridges and they're, they're um, flatter. Um, that's another sign of celiac, but that's not how we make the diagnosis. We make it by doing a biopsy of the intestine. Under the microscope, we see characteristic changes that clinch the diagnosis. On the left, these are what normal um, uh, villi look like under the microscope. Villi are these finger-like projections um, that, again, maximize surface area of the small intestine. And in people with celiac disease, we call this so-called MARSH-3. That's the characteristic that makes us most certain that someone has celiac. Um, there is a flattening of those folds. We call it villus atrophy. Villus is a single fold like that, a finger-like projection. Atrophy means that it's basically uh, shrinking or not of the normal size. So it becomes flat and it's flat because it is being attacked by these white blood cells called lymphocytes that are triggered by gluten. They see gluten as a threat and they're causing inflammation there and damage. And so as a result, the villi become flat. Shown on the left is a normal biopsy result. This is someone um, who does not have celiac disease and you can see there's a normal villus there's this finger-like projection. And shown on the right, um, you can't see those projections because they're all flat. So this is someone with celiac disease who's still eating gluten because the diagnosis has just been made. Now, typically, we start with a clinical suspicion. Maybe someone has one of those symptoms and those antibodies, the blood tests are checked. And then as a result of a positive antibody, a biopsy is performed. And if it shows villus atrophy, that abnormality, the diagnosis is confirmed and the gluten-free diet is begun. But as the schematic shows, there are multiple opportunities where people might fall through the cracks, um, whether because uh, a biopsy wasn't done or a blood test was misinterpreted um, or one of many other things. Uh, someone might go to the doctor and the doctor might not think to test for celiac disease. We also, so those are called false negatives. We also have the problem where someone is told celiac disease when in fact they don't have it because perhaps a blood test or a biopsy is, is misinterpreted. What about skipping the biopsy? Well, there are new, relatively new European guidelines that uh, apply to children, not adults, but children that say that if you have a very highly elevated antibody, and the child has symptoms, you can make that diagnosis based on that. It would apply to about half of all cases of celiac disease among children in Europe. We're concerned though that if we skip the biopsy, we might miss other diagnoses that would be picked up during the endoscopy, looking at the stomach and esophagus. And also the positive predictive value is not 100%. In other words, if you have a very highly elevated antibody test, it's not 100% sure that you got celiac disease. And because the treatment, the gluten-free diet is a lifelong or long-term treatment at least, 
we want to be close to 100%. So that's why we've been hesitant to adopt that guideline to uh, children in the United States or to adults. There is genetic testing that can be done for celiac disease. It's not a way to make uh, make up the diagnosis, but it's a way to potentially rule it out in certain cases. You see the gene, it's called DQ2 or DQ8, is present in 100% of people with celiac disease. It's a common gene. 40% of people in the general population have this gene too. So when is it useful? If it is not present, if we do the test and it turns out that that gene is absent, then we're sure that that person doesn't have celiac disease. So we do that uh, when we're testing relatives of someone with celiac disease as a way to see if we ever need to think about celiac in a person. Uh, we do it in people whose biopsy or blood test is questionable, um, borderline elevated, and not so sure. Or we do it in people who already started the gluten-free diet before they got tested for celiac disease. Because unlike the blood tests and unlike the intestinal biopsy, your genes don't change over time. And so those uh, can be tested at any time. And if that gene is negative, then you don't have celiac disease. Now, there are mimickers. There are people who have those changes on their biopsy of the intestine, but they, they don't have celiac disease. Here's just as an example, a long list of some of the other things that can cause villus atrophy. So just because someone has a biopsy that looks like celiac does not necessarily mean that they definitely have it. That's why we like to rely on both the blood test and the biopsy. It is possible that someone will have a normal blood test and a biopsy that shows celiac disease, and indeed they have celiac disease, but we always look very closely at that situation and make sure that gluten is the culprit and that they get better with a gluten-free diet, simply because there are these other causes. After the diagnosis is made, an acronym shown here uh, shows what should be done. The first thing is the most important, consultation with a dietitian who's expert in celiac disease, but also education about the condition, lifelong adherence to the gluten-free diet, though maybe if we develop uh, treatments aside from the diet, maybe it won't be lifelong, but we say long-term at least. Identification and treatment of nutritional deficiencies is important. Access to an advocacy group and continuous long-term follow-up are all part of management of celiac disease. But sometimes we're asked, can't people just Google it? You know, just Google gluten-free diet. The problem with that is there's a lot of conflicting information out there. You need to learn not just how to avoid gluten and know what not to eat. You need to know what to eat, how to have a healthy gluten-free diet, one that has enough fiber, one that has the adequate, not too little and not too much amount of calories, so one that uh, allows for a healthy, stable body weight. And one also needs to know about the potential hidden sources of gluten. After the diagnosis is made and a dietitian expert in celiac disease meets with uh, the, the person diagnosed, there's other monitoring that's done, including monitoring bones. So in adults, we do a bone density to screen for osteoporosis or brittle bones. We do blood tests periodically to monitor nutrients and, and for other autoimmune conditions. And some advocate for checking the biopsy a second time typically a couple of years after starting a gluten-free diet to see if things have healed. This is much more popular in adults uh, than on the pediatric side, but it's, uh, it seems to be a one way that we can monitor to make sure that people are avoiding gluten adequately. There are a number of reasons people might not feel better after starting uh, a gluten-free diet. One of uh, the most common actually is that it was never celiac disease to begin with, and so we always very carefully review the diagnosis. And then gluten exposure. That's extremely common because gluten is everywhere, and you'll be hearing more about that um, uh, shortly. There's something called refractory celiac disease, which is rare. That's where, despite strict avoidance of gluten, uh, the intestine remains damaged, and the person has consistent symptoms of or persistent symptoms of not absorbing nutrients. Fortunately, that occurs in probably less than 1% of people with celiac disease. So if you suspect celiac disease, a blood test should be done while you're eating gluten. Intestinal biopsy remains the main way to confirm the diagnosis. And once someone starts a gluten-free diet, the clock is ticking because the blood test and the biopsy can become normal. Right now, the gluten-free diet is the only effective treatment of celiac disease. And so expert guidance with a dietitian is key and follow-up as outlined previously is, is appropriate. Thank you for your attention.